who is ready for suit up number two? I think you're ready. I, uh, I got so much great feedback from last week's sermon. I can tell we all needed it. <laughs> right? It's what our church needs in this time, and I think we're just going to learn so much from this series. I already am, and I'm so excited to share it with you. So if you missed last week, definitely go to the FE podcast on the app or the YouTube page catch up because it was absolutely an intro that you may need throughout this this series. <clears throat> Woo, I'm out of breath from baptism. How awesome was that? <clears throat> Amen. We're talking about spiritual warfare in this series. This is a straight up spiritual warfare series. We are all in a war facing an invisible adversary who is aggressively attempting to inhibit us from experiencing all that God has for us. Life and life abundantly. Right? We, I've said it last week, and I'll probably say it many more times throughout this series, because I think most believers don't even know you're in it. It's invisible. It's, it's all around us, though, and, and this series is correcting that fact that we don't know that we're in it, but we're also teaching you how to arm yourselves, how to suit up, right? This, this doesn't have to be weird or spooky. So we're not talking about all the spooky, well, we are kind of, but it's not weird or spooky. It's, it's just real. In fact, I think there's a definite danger to keeping it weird and spooky. It's real stuff black and white in the Bible. It's pretty clear. And it definitely there's some danger in denying the existence of it. I think that may even be part of the, the enemy's plan. Like if you don't believe him, if you don't believe in a world beyond this one, a world you can't see or, or touch or even feel most of the time, then it's easier for him to work, isn't it? If you deny it even happening. <laughs> It's easy. What, what I want to cover today is one piece of the armor of God, and we're going to go kind of slowly through this throughout this series. It's, this is the piece today, the first piece in the list of Ephesians 6, but it holds all of the rest of the pieces together. All right, like I said last week, we're going to go through this bit by bit, slowly and intentionally. We're going to learn together how to put on the armor of God. So first and foremost, I want to read to you the passage that talks about the armor of God in the word, which we find in Ephesians 6, starting in verse 11. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. It says very clear in black and white, there are strategies, right? He is organized. He's efficient. He's good at what he does. The strategies of deception for you from him. All of God's armor, so you can stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against the evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against the evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor, so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then, after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Before we even get into this one piece, there's just a few things about the general armor of God I want you to notice, and we may talk a little bit about this throughout the series as well, but he says to put it on. That is an action verb, put it on, right? It doesn't get on you automatically. The armor of God doesn't just appear when you get baptized or become a Christian, okay? He says put it on, meaning God supplies it but we apply it, right? God supplies, we apply. You hear Christians sometimes say, you got to plead the blood of Jesus, plead the blood of Jesus over your situation, over whatever. What that means is you're not doing the applying. 
No, you're not doing the supplying. I'm getting them mixed up now. You're doing the applying, right? Jesus has already done it. His blood on the cross has already gotten you free, but you still have to apply it. It's the verbal equivalent of what Moses told the heads of household to do during Passover in the book of Exodus. Do you remember this story? After all the plagues of Egypt, God finally said, that's enough, we're done. It's one final plague, he's going to let you go. And he sends the angel of death into Egypt. Right? The angel of death goes around to every single household and will kill the firstborn. It actually says not one household was untouched by the angel of death, except those that had followed the instructions of God, which were to put lamb's blood on their doorposts. Right? Do you remember this story? I'm not actually going to read this one today, but I promise you it's in there around Exodus 12, 13, 14. All right? This is um, something we actually model, and, and this was the beginning of a pattern throughout the Bible. In fact, this was a yearly celebration, one of the most important on the Jewish calendar. They celebrated Passover every single year after this happened because the Israelite households were safe. Just a little bit of faith it took to follow the instructions and put the blood on their doorposts. They were safe from the angel of death, right? The angel of death has to pass by on your house, but only if you've applied the blood to your doorpost. So it's available, but they still had to participate in their own protection. Does that make sense? By the way, we're talking about spiritual warfare here, and I told you I would teach you a little bit about this stuff. So I want to stop here for just a second. Some of you last week said that you were interested in knowing how to bless and quote-unquote cleanse your home, for lack of a better word. You know, I talked about kicking out any evil spirits that are in there, and, and I could come in and do it for you, but they would, they would come crawling back, right? I'd rather you know how. So this is what we mean when we say anoint your home. In fact, all anointing oil is really hearkening back to the Passover, they put blood on their doorposts. We now use oil, and they have ever since, to represent that. Okay? Uh, so, obviously, all of the members of your household living in obedience to Jesus is the best way to protect your home. Okay? Hear me on that. But you can claim the authority of protection over your home in kind of the same way. So, you take some oil... This is just very practical teaching. Take some oil. Anointing oil isn't anything weird or spooky. We have it in the baskets around the altars, right? It's anointing oil that we've, it's, it's olive oil that we've prayed over. <laughs> you don't get it at a special Pentecostal store. I don't know that those exist. Um, you get it at the grocery store, but you pray over it. You dedicate it to God. You anoint it in that way, okay? becomes anointing oil. So you take some oil, you pray over it, you ask God to bless it, and you use it as a symbol in your home. It's now anointing oil. <laughs> you go around the doorpost in your home. You're going from room to room, using it as a symbol. Put it over your doorposts, right? And all the while, you're, you're saying, God, protect this home. Protect the people in it. Guide them. Direct them. Block anything else, anything sinister from getting in, right? And what are the three objectives Satan has for you? We talked about them last week. To kill... Steal and destroy. So you're blocking anything that would want to kill you, steal from you, or destroy you, right? We plead the blood of Jesus in our household. We anoint it in Jesus' name. We claim peace and freedom, and, and we do it all in the authority of Jesus Christ. Keep the enemy at bay, God. You're praying all these things. You're going around your home declaring Jesus, his sacrifice in your home, okay? Okay? Like, I've seen this work. I know it sounds sort of like a trite little, you're putting oil on your doors. But I've seen it work, okay? Aaron has some crazy stories from his childhood, actually, about this working. And, and he could physically see spirits being blocked from getting into his bedroom door at night. <laughs> I mean, it's real. We uh, A couple years ago, I uh, just going about my normal day, I kept feeling like something was looking at me in my house, and I would catch it out of the corner of my eye, and I'd look, and nothing was there, and 
I was like, just a trick of my eyes at first, you know, the first couple times you're like, uh, it was nothing. But after a while, I'm like, okay, something is watching me. I feel eyes on me. I can see them out of the corner of my eye. When I look, nothing's there. I feel it in my house. And so we're laying down, go to bed one night, and I was like, Aaron, I, I feel like there's something watching me. And he sits up in bed, and he's like, what? And I was like, I, I just feel like it's out of the corner of my eye. It could be nothing. And he's like, why didn't you tell me this sooner? Like, he was always, almost mad at me. Like, why wouldn't you tell me this? And he gets up immediately, and he's marching around the house, anointing stuff. He's praying over it. He's, he said he even went outside in his underwear. <laughs> marching around the house in the dark. <laughs> He's praying, I mean, he's doing all the things I just said. He's praying in the spirit. He's praying against anything that would, and I've never seen that thing again. He said while he was praying, he actually felt like it was a spy sent from the enemy to see where he could get at us, right? He's watching, checking in. Not in my house. That's right. That's what he said. Not in my house. Not today, Satan. Right? So... (laughs) We take these things seriously in our house. We could actually tell you story after story. He, he one time felt a presence in our bedroom while we were sleeping. I slept soundly, didn't even wake up. Uh, but he felt a presence, and he sat up immediately, and he went at it again. Uh, you have to know what authority you're claiming, what authority that you walk in. right? You are not beholden to these things. You don't have to be afraid in your own home. In this household, we worship Jesus, right? Me and my household are going to worship the Lord. And you declare that in your home. Walk in that authority. I find so many Christians that are so afraid. You don't have to be afraid. You are a child of God. That is your inheritance, your birthright. March against those things. Stand up. And sometimes that's all it takes. Somebody saying, not today, okay? Okay. Right? We, we used to have, uh, when my dad pastored here, he would always, almost every single time he went out of town, he would sit the staff down and he'd say, look, I'm going out of town. Stuff tends to happen when I go out of town. And he did not mean cameras would break down or, you know, microphones would go awry. He meant spiritual stuff would happen. <coughs> While the pastor's away, the demons play, I guess. I don't know. So... He would, you know, because he is the authority. The pastor is the authority, the covering, the shepherd over a house of God. And so he would always tell us, when you come in on Sunday morning, I won't be here. You need to take authority. Right? And so we would. In fact, we, he realized this by trial and error. (laughs) Right? When he was away, stuff would happen and, and we weren't prepared and whatever. So that's why every single time that we actually intentionally came into the building like on Sunday morning, 6 a.m., the sun's just coming up, I'm walking into church, and I'm like, I take authority. I'm the authority in this house today. You're not coming in here today to mess with us. We're going to focus on Jesus. You don't get to be a distraction, right? And nothing would happen. (laughs) Because when you take authority, it's powerful. Again, like we talked about last week, you have to know what authority you're walking in. You have to actually have a relationship with Jesus. This is not an incantation. It's not empty words. It doesn't work that way. You're claiming your authority in Jesus Christ. Not that you, not that Candace has any authority. Jesus has it. I'm claiming it, right? He supplied it. I'm applying it. Does that make sense? Yeah. The angel of death in the book of Exodus, by the way, he didn't stop to make sure that everyone in the household was worthy first. <clears throat> he didn't go in and check. He didn't say, have they been good little boys and girls? He didn't keep a naughty and nice list. Okay, If you had faith enough to put lamb's blood on your door, he passed on by. This is a picture of Jesus' blood on the cross, by the way. Jesus' blood did the same thing for us, and we're claiming that authority when we're using the oil as the symbol in our households. Okay? So Ephesians says, put on the armor of God, not just part of it, <clears throat> all of it. Right? Because like I said last week, wherever you're unclothed, you're uncovered. Satan's not looking for all the places that you're uncovered. He just wants that one. And I think that's what that spy was about, right? Looking for the one place he could get at us. The one vulnerability, right? 
<clears throat> so you have to put on the armor of God. That's where I was being a little bit lazy about it. Like, oh, there might be something in the house. But Aaron was like, no, no, no. Right? We're putting on the armor of God. We're going to be intentional about this. So you put on the full armor. Not some of it, all of it. And again, I'll probably say this a lot throughout the series. So today we're going to focus on the belt of truth. Right? Verse 14 says, stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth. Why did Paul put so much emphasis on truth? Why is it a belt, right? Yes, this is all metaphor. It doesn't add up exactly. He's speaking in metaphor. You have to understand that. But Paul called it that for a reason. And when Paul was writing this, he was actually in prison when he wrote this letter. And probably looking at a lot of Roman armor, <laughs> right? And it was all around him on the soldiers. And so he started to make these connections of what is armor in a spiritual sense. Truth is like a belt. So the belt in Roman armor actually held everything together. It held the weapons up, right? They didn't have zippers and buttons and things like that then, but they had belts, and it held all of the weapons up. It held everything together. Belts in general, they keep you from being exposed, right? Keep you from being embarrassed. They keep you put together, Everything that you've prepared and planned, meticulously, they probably made a lot of their own weapons back then. They've, they're put together with a belt, right? If you don't have truth, it works in a similar way. None of the other weapons work, okay? Prayer is a weapon. Praise can be a weapon against the enemy. It's how we fight our battles, right? Binding and loosing is a weapon. But if you don't know the truth about these things, they won't work, like the story we read last week about the sons of Sceva, right? They were trying to use Jesus as an incantation. It was empty words. They didn't know him. They got beat up, right, to a pulp, actually. So they didn't know the truth about it. It didn't work for them. This is why the devil likes to keep you out of the house of truth, <laughs> right? Christians like to, to say, I, I'm a, you don't need church to be a Christian, yeah, technically all you need is Jesus, but where you're unclothed, you're uncovered. And if you're not weekly, daily, constantly in communion and community with other believers, if you're not hearing truth on a weekly at least basis, we need to be reminded so much more than we need to be taught. I need to be reminded every Sunday morning when I'm worshiping, I was going to say wholeheartedly, but it's the times when I'm worshiping like kind of half-heartedly that I need reminded the most. Right? I need that reminder to get me back on track that God actually is in control. That's what I was saying about worship earlier. It reminds you who he is. He is bigger than we think most of the time on a day-to-day -day basis. We, we put him in our little box. We minimize him to some degree. Worship makes him big again, where he should be. If you don't have truth, none of the other weapons work. You need that truth. Right? It's something you can't always remind yourself of. This is, again, why we need church. Because how many of you leave here feeling convicted about something or inspired about something almost every week? I'm, I do too, right? The practice of getting together edifying each other, encouraging each other, reminding each other about things we've already learned. It's something integral to the, the Christian walk. It's something you can't always do yourself because you can't always see yourself correctly, accurately, right? We're good at deceiving ourselves, especially about ourselves. I'll get to that in a minute. But the Holy Spirit can see you accurately. You can get inspiration from anywhere, a poem, a movie, a self-help book. Inspiration gives you the motivation to fight, but it doesn't necessarily give you the skills to win. This is what we do at church. Every single week, whether we're talking specifically about spiritual warfare or not, the truth will set you free. Preaching the Bible, I <clears throat> will sometimes get off the stage and say, oh, how do you feel like that went to Aaron on the way home? And I feel like I missed it somehow. I just, I don't know. But you know what, God? We preach the word, and I'm just going to trust that you, <laughs> right? It's not my words anyway. I'm going to trust that the truth went out, and that's all that was 
necessary. We're preaching truth here. It's meant to set you free. So we make sure we, we put on truth is what Paul is saying. Put on the belt of truth. There's a lot of pithy sayings out there that sound nice and sound true. But the Bible is true. This is one of the, these bottom lines for me. Right? Anytime I'm studying the word, because the word it can be crazy, y'all. If you've not read through the Old Testament lately, oh, it's some of it's tough. The word is true. It's in the back of my mind always. I don't always know why it's true, but it is true. And it's not only true, it is the source of truth. It hit me a while ago that truth is deep. It's Truth can be layered and complex, right? When God gives me a word, it's usually only a few words. It's very short. When I feel like I really heard something specific from him, but it always feels deep. I always do this motion because I don't know how else to. It feels deep, like there's layers to his word. He only said a few words to me, but I feel like it's something deeper, right? Truth is deep. It's layered and complex. It's why stories can feel true to us will actually be in complete fiction. They can communicate truth while being totally made up. <laughs> right? Truth is layered. It's complex. Deception is shallow. Deception, lies, they're, they're pretty easy to pick apart when you have half a mind to. The problem is most of us don't have half a mind to pick apart deception. In fact, we want to be deceived. <laughs> God's word is tough to take sometimes. It's convicting. Truth can be hard to swallow. Deception is easy. It's nice. It feels good in the moment, right? It's a path that's easy to take. For example, we like to judge other people. It's fun. We like it. We'd rather judge someone else's choices, for example, than examine why they made that choice, right? It's more work to, to see things from their perspective because truth can be layered and complex. We have to dig a little to find the truth. We have to know the whole story to understand their perspective. It's a lot easier to judge them. Deception is the enemy's main weapon in his three objectives, to kill, steal, and destroy. He loves to deceive us. He's been doing it since the garden. And the thing is, he doesn't even have to work that hard. We're good at it all by ourselves. Right? Sexual identity is one of these big ticket items right now for him. It's a big deception item. They're trying to convince someone to question their own identity that they were conceived with. Way beyond their control. And yet to convince them that they do have control over it. Well, if, if I can pick that, then what use is God? Right? Why look at what he says about me and his control over my identity if I can just make it all up myself? This isn't new, by the way. Every, everyone thinks sexual sin, sexual immorality is somehow new to this era. But again, read Genesis 19. Read any of Genesis, really. You can probably turn to any page in Genesis and find sexual sin and the acceptance of sexual sin. It's not new. Genesis, by the way, means formation or creation of something. It was the beginning, y'all. That's what I'm trying to say. It's been around. Like, it didn't take us very long in creation to figure out how to use other humans' bodies in a selfish way. It's been around a while. It's not new. And sex is so tied to our identity. It's, it's why sin in that area is against our own bodies, the Bible says. It's so dangerous because it affects how we see ourselves, which inevitably affects how we see God. It's a spiritual warfare battle that we lose all the time because it's so easily won in the mind, fought in the mind. Jesus deepened some of the Jewish laws, actually. The Jewish law says don't commit adultery, right? Jesus said, even if you think about your friend's wife, it's adultery. He deepened it. <laughs> it's, it's, it happens in the mind. Culture wants to tell you that everyone looks at porn. It's totally normal and even healthy. 
you hear that all the time on TV shows. The truth is that porn is addictive and corrosive to not only your faith, but your very identity as a person. To choose to look at it is a loss in a spiritual warfare battle. Don't be deceived because, again, we like to be deceived. We like to tell ourselves we are in control of it. It doesn't have control of me. We like to tell ourselves um, it's only me it's affecting and no one else, right? It's normal. It's, it's healthy. It's necessary even. The truth is everything in your life will be affected by an addiction to porn eventually. The truth is everything in your life will be affected by adultery. Everything in your life will be affected if you let yourself get away with sexual sin, even little things, because they don't stay little. More true statement about Satan, and, and he loves to deceive us, might actually be he loves to lead us to deception. Because again, he doesn't have to do all that much. We like it. We like to be deceived. It's nicer in the moment. In the garden, all he did was actually ask a question first. Do you know this story? We're actually going to read it. Genesis 3. He didn't outright lie to Eve at first. In fact, there's a whole lot of truth in what he says. He led her to be deceived. Genesis 3 verse 1. Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? It's not even... No, he didn't say that, right? And she says that. He, he just planting seeds of doubt, just questioning God was foreign to them, okay? He's just planting the seeds. Verse 2, of course we can eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replies. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. Verse 4, here's the lie. You won't die. That's a straight-up lie. A more true statement is just a little bit off, though. You won't die right away. They didn't. You won't die, the sermon replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The rest of that's not technically wrong, right? See how Satan has a little bit of lie to mostly truth. He twists it just enough to convince us. He, he plays to the things that we want. We want to be deceived. Wisdom, it's, it's not a bad thing to want, and he plays to that. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful, and its fruit looked delicious. So were all the other trees in the garden created perfectly by God, right? But she wanted the wisdom it would give her. She wanted the wisdom. Wisdom and knowledge aren't necessarily bad things to want. They're not. <laughs> but we have to remember that when we get those things from a source other than God, like we talked about last week, it's going to be laced with information that will kill us, steal from us, or destroy us ultimately. The truth that she gained from her interaction with the snake in the garden ultimately tormented her. Right? She took some of the fruit and ate it. And she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. And at that moment, their eyes were opened. And they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. <laughs> their eyes were open. Satan told them they would be, right? That was true. Their eyes were opened, but with that opening came shame. They were cast out of the presence of God, and ultimately, hundreds of years later, came death. The way that God communicates truth does not bring shame along with it. Truth that comes from the word is life-giving, freeing. Truth that comes from Satan is meant to torment you. All right, John 8, verse 31, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Knowledge from the enemy, teachings from the enemy bring bondage, meaning we're now tied to shame from that thing. It brings pain and torment, knowledge that you really didn't want to know. You just didn't know you didn't want to know it until it's too late. But God's truth sets you free. Jesus said, remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth. Ask questions of the word. 
don't question the word. Does that distinction make sense? I ask questions of the word all the time, but it's not, is this true? Because I know it's true. It's God, why is this true? Help me understand why. So I, I can figure out how to apply it to my life. The, the Bible is true. It's the source of truth. But why is it true? Not why is it true for me. Not at first, anyway. I always teach my ladies in Bold and Brave and in Bible studies and stuff. You have to figure out why it was true for the people in context of the time that the Bible is talking to. Why was it true for them? And then why is it true for me? If you don't do that first, if you do it in the wrong order, it tends to get <laughs> a little skewed. People in, in different times and contexts and cultures needed to hear different things. Why did they need to hear it? And then, okay, so how does that apply to me? All right, Jesus said, remain faithful to my teachings. For you to do that, you have to know them. Be in them. Remind yourself of his teachings all the time. Try to understand the deeper meanings so you can live them out. And a lot of us need to be more discerning about who we're listening to. And I don't just mean Hollywood, Disney. <laughs> That's where Christians like to go all the time. But most of our deception about religion came from religion. Be careful. <laughs> The internet both made it way more easy to get information and way more easy to get misinformation. And I've, I don't like to be a pastor basher. It's not something I do because it's a very tough job. We're all learning and growing and all of that. But a lot of pastors today, they just want their quotes shared on social media. They want their voice heard, not his voice heard necessarily. Just be careful. Right? That's all I'm saying. Ask questions. And I saw someone lately share a pastor quote, and I'm not calling anyone out because I don't remember who, this is, who, who it was. It doesn't matter. But the quote was something like, we need more story-sharing pastors, not... No, we don't need more story-sharing pastors. We need more demon-slaying pastors. And on the surface, you want to be like, whoo, yeah, that's good. We do. But question that for even just a second. Why not just more pastors? <laughs> Why not just more ministers? We need more people out there. Like, if I could get all of you to go into work this week and share a story of what God did in your life, how powerful would that be? You're not going to go into all your work and cast out demons tomorrow. I, it's just probably not realistically going to happen. <laughs> but I might be able to get you all to share a story, and wouldn't that be a great thing? And... Besides that, didn't Jesus share stories constantly? Like, it was like his main method for sharing kingdom truths, setting people free, or stories. In fact, he shared 39 parables in the Gospels that we can see, but I only see him, there's 12 instances of him casting out demons, him himself. So three times as many stories as demon casting out. Both are important. But stories set more people free, <laughs> right? You wouldn't know that Jesus told all those stories if you weren't in the word for yourself. The word is how you put on this belt of truth, okay? It's how you stand on truth by knowing it intimately. I, I knew, I've grown up obviously in this church around the word all my life, and I guess I knew pieces of it. I was always jealous of those Christian school kids that got to know it from a curriculum standpoint though. Not that it helped many of them, but I didn't get to know the word. I mean, intimately, where I could tell you where stories are, you know, and I knew all the books of the Bible all my life. I can quote all 66 to you in order right now, but I knew it intimately when I started teaching it. Teach it. You don't have to have a stage and a microphone and a pulpit. Teach it to somebody, anybody else. This is what I learned this week. What do you think? Right? It, it creates this anchor and volunteer in kids' ministry. I taught kids three, four times a week for six years before I got up here. Right? It, you learn so much more when you teach it than when you just read it. In fact, we have to both study it and read it. Cannot be 
one or the other. In fact, pastors need to hear more often. You still have to read the word, not just study it. <laughs> read it. The Bible wants to tell you things, not just your church things. Okay? The word, though, is how we put on his belt of truth because you can't know what God would say if you don't know what he has said. This is discernment. This is how you put on the belt of truth, understanding what he has said and asking the Holy Spirit for discernment. In fact, Charles Spurgeon wrote, discernment isn't knowing the difference between right and wrong. Discernment is knowing the difference between right and almost right. I think wisdom is knowing the difference between right and wrong. Knowledge, right? Knowing not just what to say, but when to say it. Not just what not to say, but when not to say it. Discernment is knowing the difference between right and almost right. Because Satan is almost right a lot, intentionally. He has a counterfeit for everything God does. Everything. He can do it, but worse. Or he can pretend to do it. He can do it in a flawed way, right? <clears throat> it's why in Exodus, you know, as I was, I was reading that Passover, those Passover passages, in Exodus 12, 13, 14. I came across a verse last night. <laughs> it literally says, let me just read it, Exodus 12, 12. On that night I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt. For I am the Lord. And it suddenly struck me, the people were obviously getting judged too, their firstborns dying, but that's not what God was talking about. He said the gods of Egypt, the Egyptian gods they worshiped back then were real. They just weren't gods in the big G sense. They were worshiped as gods in the little G sense. In fact, I found this verse and I, I was just like, it opened up kind of a new line of thinking for me just last night. I'm not sure if even processed it completely yet. I think a lot of times as Christians, we want to say those things aren't real. God is real. Those things aren't real. God wouldn't have anything to execute judgment against if it wasn't real. It was real. It just came under the authority of God. Does that make sense? To say that it's not real is actually a little dangerous because the Egyptian magicians could counterfeit almost every one of the miracles that Moses threw at them. So, say you're an Egyptian in this scenario, and you've been told that the Egypt, or maybe Israelite would be more accurate, and you've been told that the Egyptian gods aren't real, but you walk into a scenario where suddenly you're seeing them perform the same things as Moses. Well, that's real, but Christianity says it's not real. I'm mixing metaphors here. Let's go with me. So Christianity must not be real. We do this to our kids a lot. We tell them ghosts aren't real. These things aren't real. This, the Egyptian gods weren't real. But then they go out into the world and they play with a Ouija board or <laughs> they experience something because it's not real. There's no danger there, right? But they experience something real. So if that's real, Christianity must not be real because it says it's not. It's dangerous to deny the existence. The Bible said, the gods of Egypt. God, I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt. They were very real beings, deceiving an entire nation, but ultimately subject to God's authority. Not as powerful, but real. Does that make sense? To say all these things aren't real, it's, it's dangerous. Why worship something lesser, though? It's lesser. Any information you get from them, even though it's real, they can get you real information, but it's meant to kill you, steal from you, or destroy you. Why worship the counterfeit when you have the real thing? <laughs> to say it doesn't exist is, is dangerous, especially in parenting. Counterfeiting from the enemy is so good. Feels real, right? Feels good. 
We like to be deceived about it. It's the main way the enemy gets us. Shares have truths. He makes us question truths. He sows these tiny little seeds of doubt. Know the truth. You can know the truth. I'm pointing at this because this is my Bible most days. <laughs> BibleGateway.com. Know the truth. The truth will set you free. Know what the Bible actually says, not just what you think it says. Christians have all kinds of sayings that are not found in the Bible. Just They're not even in there. <laughs> we think they are, but they are not, not even in there. This is why we have to study it, not just read it, and read it, not just study it. Just <clears throat> Discernment is a bit like knowing what God would say and what he wouldn't. Right? What sounds like him and what doesn't. For example, I've been married to my husband 15 years, together almost 20, right? I knew him before that too. I know what his voice sounds like, right? You know what your best friend, your, your spouse, what their voice sounds like. But more than that, you know what they would say and probably what they wouldn't say. Don't get me wrong, Aaron surprises me all the time. But there are things that if somebody came up to me and told me that he said, just no right? I don't believe it because I know him. Like if you came up to me and said, man, Aaron really loved the candy corn I had out. He ate the whole bowl. He told me he could eat the whole bag. No, just no. He wouldn't say that unless it was sarcastically. You would never catch him dead saying that, even just to be nice to you about it. He wouldn't. I know my husband, right? He values honesty over being nice. <laughs> he wouldn't even say it just to be nice to you, okay? I've spent the past 20 Octobers with him. He loathes candy corn with an everlasting hatred that will burn in his soul for all eternity. Am I being exaggerative? Not even a little bit. He hates it. And I know that because I've spent time with him, right? Because we talk. We've had experiences together. We've spent the last 20 Octobers together, okay? This is sort of like discernment. I've gotten to know my husband, so I know what he would say and what he wouldn't say. Not every time, but most of the time. This is why you can only get discernment, like I said last week, from the source. I can't give it to you. You get it from studying the word, by spending time with God, knowing his voice. God is a shepherd. The sheep know his voice. He leads us. He restores us. He speaks to us. He sings over us. He protects us, and he spends time with us. Do some people have a special knack for discernment? Absolutely. Aaron, by the way, is one of them. <laughs> You're having trouble figuring out if something's from God or not? He can probably tell you. I tend to be stronger in wisdom, which actually helps me preach, you know, the theoretical stuff. But... <laughs> Discernment is better in real-world situations, right? It's kind of like street smarts in that way, um, sort of the spiritual version, I guess, of street smarts. It's knowing something is off and why. I can usually know when something is off, but sometimes I'll go to Aaron like, why is this off? Help me put words to it. I can feel it's wrong, but and he knows immediately, like immediately. So some people do have a special knack for this. It is a spiritual gift, but we can also learn it by knowing God, understanding him, and asking the Holy Spirit for it. He wants to give you gifts, right? It's a spiritual gift to have discernment. Most Christians who've walked with God for a while, and I mean years and years, they have some discernment. Because when you know what God has said, you know what he would say. We need discernment to put on the belt of truth and to keep it on. Because Satan doesn't just use his demons, he uses deception. Bad doctrine is deception. And people say all kinds of things at funerals. We officiated a funeral yesterday, and I didn't hear much of this at this funeral, but <laughs> things, little things, Christians love to say little nice, they sound nice things, like God just needed him more than we did. Say that to a kid who just lost his dad at a funeral and watch them grow up hating God. Why would God take him? I need him. I need him at my baseball game. I need him at my school play. I need my dad. A Christian told me God needed him. Is that biblical, even remotely? 
death is a part of the curse, right? It's because we live in a fallen world. Sometimes things just happen because of that. God didn't take him from you because he needs him. A bad doctrine does this. We have to watch what we say. Be discerning about the things that come out of our mouth and the things we take in, too. Christians have said all kinds of stuff to us. When Aaron was going through a kidney failure, we got told by multiple people, just don't go back to the doctors. Don't listen to anything they say. God's going to heal you. God is a healer, yes. But we felt like from God that we need to follow this transplant route. (laughs) He would be dead today if we didn't have discernment. We're so busy looking for nukes sometimes that we miss the little landmines. Solomon said, catch the little foxes that spoil the vine. The things, little things doing damage can lead to much bigger things down the road. We need discernment. We need to pray for more discernment for our people, for the church, right? Some of us have developed faith for something that just isn't true. Have you ever heard John Chris, he's a comedian, he says, I ain't praying for that. It's a whole skin. Google it. It's hilarious. But he, he says, you know, some people will, will ask you to pray for, you know, some random person's second or third beach house. Right on the beach, there's a hurricane coming. He's like, so you're asking me to let the hurricane hit all the poor people's homes, but not, I'm, I ain't praying for that, right? Some things we've developed faith for that just aren't. We can name and claim. There's all this teaching out there about naming and claiming things. We can bind and loose things. But there are some things you just have to live through. Some things you can't just put on. You have to earn. Joy, for example, is one of these things that you put on. The Bible says put on joy like clothing. Put it on. Jesus has already supplied it. We have to apply it. But faith is one of those things that you got to walk through some stuff to build faith. Right? You can't just put it on like that. The love of God can't be earned. It can only be given. But some of us are out here trying to earn it. Discernment helps us figure all of that out. We need discernment. It's necessary to understand spiritual spiritual truth, to live holy as God intends, to avoid life's pitfalls and dangers, even to properly govern a church society. You need discernment. Church life needs a few people with discernment because it sounds really good to go around to people in the church and say, I just don't know what the, those pastors are doing anymore. You know, I don't know about these decisions. And we start to get a whole group of people upset about stuff. But it takes one person with discernment to say, yo, Matthew 18 says when you have a problem with another believer, go to them. Have you done that? Have you asked the question? Right? Do that, and then it'll probably be cleared up. And Matthew 18 is... Practically magical. It's amazing. Matthew 18, verse 15-ish. There's just three, four small verses maybe that just clear up interpersonal confrontational stuff so well. It takes one person who knows and uses Matthew 18 to say, hey, go talk to somebody. The, the actual person, not all the other, to go talk to them. And I bet this will be cleared up, right? This is spiritual warfare, but it's practical. The Bible can be both, practical and spiritual. There's nothing more dangerous to the enemy than a unified church, a unified army. So it's the little things that spoil that. Of course he wants us all grumbling and disagreeing over little dumb things. I have heard of churches splitting over whether or not to have pews. That's what I'm saying. It's a seat. Are you really? You're really going to get that heated over where you put your butt. Some of you have never been to a third world country church, and it shows. <laughs> I've been all over the world in third world countries. You, you would. American Christians care about things like stained glass windows and seats or how long the service is or whether there's child care or not. Christians in Ecuador, Christians in South Africa, Christians in Lesotho, Christians in India, they don't care about literally any of those things. They're coming to church. <laughs> just, and they're happy to be there. I have been 
to all of those places, and it's just amazing. They're genuine worship. They're so hungry. They're willing to travel all day, be there all day, not sit anywhere. They don't even have seats a lot of the times. They don't have child care, none of it. They're worshiping their whole hearts. It's chaos, but they, they don't care. My dad was in an African country lately where they had one Bible for multiple churches. <sighs> The pastors got together every week to share it so they could prepare their messages. Not joking. (laughs) He's since raised money to buy them dozens of Bibles. And we have American churches hung up on pews or chairs. I hear the same kinds of Christians railing against culture all the time. How dare culture do this? And the media do that. And politics do this. And Disney, how dare they? But they don't realize Christian culture can be just as divisive. Christian culture has affected them to such a degree that they're willing to throw down with another believer over where to put their butt. Petty, cultural, not biblical wants. Things that just simply make them more comfortable as a believer in church. By the way, look up the history of pews. (laughs) If you, I'm just, I can't get into it right now, but just look it up. You wouldn't believe so highly in them. And you all don't. You're sitting in blue 20 year old chairs, but uh, they wouldn't believe in them so highly if they knew the history. That's all I'm saying. In fact, I, I see Jesus making sinners comfortable and making the religious very uncomfortable on purpose. He does it intentionally a lot. If you've studied the gospel lately, if you've gotten into the word, i.e. truth, you know what I'm talking about. People who do these kinds of things, they stir up the pews, issues, and whatever, they always have a scripture to back it up. I'm sure someone would throw a Bible verse at you to support their view on pews. But it's kind of what I'm talking about when I say not everything is spiritual. Sometimes a chair is just a chair. Churches usually want to change from pews to chairs to be more practical and use the sanctuary for more things to make the church more effective. And people are throwing down about pews because it's how we grew up. That's church. It's not church without a pew. It's not church without Jesus. That is the only. <laughs> There's five purposes of the church. Where you sit is not, it's not even a requirement to sit. Someone always has a problem. Of those, they will throw verses at you. I once had, I don't know if I should tell this story. I'm gonna anyway. I once had, a few years ago, there was a very, very tall lady, taller than me, and that's saying something, came in to church, sat like right here. And she, through, started in worship, she started the first song, she was dancing. And I mean, I say tall because it's relevant to the story. When you're doing this in the middle of the row, it's noticeable to everyone in the room. Just dancing, whatever. Very, very loud and showy. And by the end of the first song, she's out in the middle of the aisle. By the end of the second song, she's up here. And again, still doing all of these movements. She's twirling and right here. And by the end of the third song, she's all the way across. She's literally touching the front of the stage. She's going the whole way across, all these big showy movements. Some of you might even remember this. It wasn't that long ago. Fourth song, Aaron's like about ready to start, stop worship. He's like, she's touching me practically. What is happening? On the way back to her seat, and I kid you not, after worship is over, she's handing out business cards the whole way back the rows. She sits down, and I'm (laughs) sitting in the back at this point just keeping an eye on her and fuming because I happen to know that a first-time guest of a friend was in the front row right here, right in front of this lady. And I knew that they were taking a chance on church, right? They thought it was weird and spooky and not for me, and they were just, they were convinced to come that one day. And this lady shows up, and they... Never came back. I don't know if they ever tried church again. Obviously never came back. 
but I, I spoke to this lady after service. <laughs> and I said, hey, uh, you're welcome to dance. Dancing in God's presence isn't a bad thing, right? But maybe in the back where you're not distracting the entire room. Uh, and she threw scripture after scripture after scripture at me, supporting, <laughs> dancing, Holy Spirit dancing. In fact, her cards were about learning English as a second language and Holy Spirit dancing. <clears throat> Don't think it's what Jake Curlin meant a few weeks ago when he said, praise dance the walls down, right? <laughs> uh, <sighs> Obvious self-promotion. But someone without a discerning heart would take those scriptures and say, you know what, you're right. Dancing in, in worship is a good thing, right? You're worshiping God. Why, who am I to stifle that expression to God? But a discerning heart says that wasn't, it wasn't worship at all if it's self-promotion. <laughs> it's not worship at all. If you're willing to override someone's potential salvation for your own worship. That's not worship. It's not even in the realm of worship. And finally, I ended up saying to her, I'm the shepherd of this house, because she kept throwing shepherd type quotes at me. It's like, I'm the shepherd of this house, and I'm going to ask you not to do it ever again. Just had to be clear with her. And <laughs> she called me a false prophet and got lots of nasty emails that week about being a false prophet. She came back two more times after that. <laughs> and every time I headed her off before service, I said, hey, just a reminder, we're not doing that again. Right? The smile on my face. Love you. You're welcome to, to worship in the back. Not up front, okay? She left before both services. <laughs> but that's, a, that's what I mean by discernment, because Satan will often use Scripture. He uses Scripture to put on the belt of truth properly. We need the Word, but we also need discernment, because Scripture can very easily be twisted and used against you. Back to the worship thing. When people are only in it for themselves, you can feel it, and it's disgusting. It's gross. You can just feel it. When it's genuine, but I ask the youth kids, they're in the back worshiping passionately, dancing around. I'm like, come up front. Like, let that permeate the, like, we can all use a little of that because it's genuine, right? <laughs> I don't mind that. It's not dancing in church that's the problem the selfishness of it. It's the promotion, self-promotion of it. When it's genuine, it's attractive. When it's selfish, it's gross. <clears throat> but we need the Holy Spirit. You can know all of the scriptures. Literally, you could have the entire Bible memorized, but not have the heart of Jesus. You can use all his words, but not have his heart behind them and still be wrong. Just I'm going to close with this, but just to prove this, I want you to see it in black and white. Matthew 4, verse 1. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. A biggest understatement in the Bible, by the way. During that time, the devil came and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stories, stones, tell these stones to become loaves of bread well within the power of Jesus, right? But he said, no. Using scripture, the scriptures say, people don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to a holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point in the temple, and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, this is Satan quoting scripture to Jesus to convince him, Right? The scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. It's the purest example of discernment with scripture. This is Jesus using it. Next, the devil took him to a peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, as if that's something he can do. If you will kneel down and worship me, get out of here, Satan. Jesus told him, for the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil went away and angels came and took care of Jesus. Satan will use scripture. <laughs> you have to be careful. Discernment helps you keep the belt of truth on not only 
wear it, but keep it on. Jesus was the ultimate example of knowing the word and having discernment, knowing the word and knowing how to use it, knowing the difference between right and almost right. The Pharisees came after him. I could share story after story of them trying to trap him with scripture, right? They often quoted scripture or they questioned him about it, his interpretation of it. But Jesus had discernment every single time. Every time. And that came from spending time with his father, knowing and reading the scriptures, and being baptized in the Holy Spirit. So we not only need the word, but we need to use it correctly. And we need the Holy Spirit to help us discern it. Warfare, spiritual warfare is based on truth. Knowing the truth will set you free. And being able to discern the truth gives you an edge in spiritual warfare that most don't have. We have to suit up. Put on the belt of truth. We need it in this Christian walk. Can I pray for you? That we would all have it. Father, we ask you today to reveal truth to us, but also help us discern it. Help us understand it. Help us be able to walk through this life knowing good and evil, right and wrong, right and almost right. Help us understand the the difference between just knowing scripture and knowing the heart of Jesus. God, help us be people that live and breathe the word of God. We not only read it, we study it. We we pick it apart. We figure it out. We ask questions. We seek to actually understand, not just quote it to judge other people. Give us discernment, Father. And Father, those things that we've been deceiving ourselves about the things that Satan has been working in our lives, but but we like to be deceived. (laughs) We participate in the deception. God, reveal those things today. Bring them to the surface. Convict us. Not make us feel guilty. That is that it's Satan's counterfeit of conviction. Conviction from the Holy Spirit draws you to God to his love. It actually makes the love of God the focal point, not your sin. Conviction says God loves you so much, right? And that makes you say, I want to give this thing up and and I, I want none of that anymore. I just want God. Whereas guilt makes you want to run away. Shame makes you want to run and hide from God, get away from him. The Holy Spirit can convict us, bring us closer to God, and also have us clean up some of that stuff, the selfish stuff, the sin that's that's been lurking in our lives that we love to be deceived about. God, right now, I just ask that you work on hearts and minds. Show us where we've gone wrong. Bring us back into a right relationship with you. Heads bowed and eyes still closed. I just want to give you an opportunity to respond to this today. First of all, just to respond to Jesus. To say, I've I've never understood the Passover, the blood, all of it just like that. I, I want to claim the blood of Jesus in my life. His sacrifice, I now understand, covers my sin. I don't have to feel it anymore. Forgiveness is a gift. God gave you with Jesus on the cross. You just have to apply it. If that's you today and you're saying, I I want Jesus, I'm in. I'm into following Jesus. I'm in to everything that entails. And maybe it's the first time you've ever said it, demonstrated it out loud. If that's you and you're in the room, would you just slip your hand up? I want Jesus. I'm in. If you're watching online, you can text the number on the screen or type I'm in in the comments. We'd love to help you with that decision. I'm in to following Jesus. Just slip your hand up if you're in the room. Maybe today you're saying, I need to repent. Some hidden things going on in my life, some some hidden sin. I 
I've been deceiving myself about for a while, participating in the enemy's deception. I need to give that up today. If that's you, just heads bowed and eyes closed, just between you and God, raise your hand up. I want to repent today. There's some stuff going on. I need to let go. Thank you. Thank you. You can put those down. And finally, maybe you just need to spend more time in the Word. <laughs> That's your takeaway today. I, I don't know enough of it to have discernment. I, I don't know enough of it to know what God would say. Today, I'm going to commit spending more time in the Word. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Father, I thank you and I praise you for every single response. Bless them. Teach them. Guide them. Direct them. Breathe your Holy Spirit on us today. We thank you. Thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. One last thing before Tom comes. If you'd like the baptism in the Holy Spirit, I didn't mention this today, but Jesus went to be tempted in the wilderness immediately after getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. He was baptized in water, and also the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove. Do you remember that story? The Holy Spirit helped enable him to not only get through a 40-day fast intact, but spiritually intact. He was able to use the word against the enemy himself and know the difference. Even when his body was weak, that was the Holy Spirit, right? So if you want to get baptized in the Holy Spirit, if you want to get free of some stuff today, the, the prayer team is going to come and be available. I just wanted to make sure we offer that. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is an another step in the Christian walk. It is having the Holy Spirit not just come on you occasionally, but dwell within you, help you know the difference between right and almost right, give you that discernment and the gifts that can only come from him. Okay, we'd love to pray for you for that. Prayer team will be available immediately after service. Thank you.